Good afternoon and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Estimate and Taxation for May 10th, 2023. I'm Samantha Priestenson. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the president of the BET. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so that we can verify the presence of a quorum. Board Member Abene. Present. Board Member Kosky is at present. Board Member Fry. Here. Board Member Jenkins is absent. Vice President Brandt. Here. President Priest Dinson. Present. There are five members here present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum and we will now proceed to our regular agenda, a copy of which has been posted to the public access system, city's legislative information management system available at limbs.minneapolismn.gov. Board members, the agenda for today's business is before us. May I please have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We have a proper motion before us. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All, any opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the agenda is adopted. Next, we move on to the acceptance of minutes from the April 26, 2023 meeting. Uh, may I please have a motion to accept those minutes? Is there a second? We have a proper motion before us. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Next, we move to our public comment section. Um, we welcome members of the public to make public comments related to current board business. Per our bylaws, the public comment period is limited to a total of 10 minutes. Given the number of people signed up to speak today, we actually have exactly 10. So I've set the clock for one minute, allowing one minute for each speaker so we can accommodate all 10 people who have um, signed up to speak. Uh, we thank you for being here today. Um, and we can move forward with our first speaker, uh, it didn't quite come through on the copy. Ms. Brock. Uh, it appears to be D. Crank. Crank? All right. Thank you for being here with us today. There is one minute on the clock, and once you get there, do not rush yourself. We will start the clock. Yep, you can come right up here to this microphone if you would. Welcome. And you may begin. I am. I think it's overwhelming for me a little bit, but I'm going to speak. Um, I came because I live at Linway Manor mm -hmm. on North 3rd Street, apartment 313. And the guy's shower water comes down on me and my shower. So I don't like it. It's very unclean. I don't like it and don't know, know what to do about it. I called the command center, and I also reported it to the property manager, and she looked like she can. Nobody knows what to do. It's been there before. I've been there four years, but it was okay up until this year. Then the water comes down. But the three years before then, but you could tell it was already done before. So there's something wrong. So I'm a little upset about it. That's what made me come down to here, to the office, came down here. But anyway, that's all I got to say. I'm not happy about it, so I hope something's done. Thank you for being willing to share and be vulnerable. I know that's not easy to share your pain like that, so I thank you for being here with us today. Our next speaker is Ms. Alice Bowron. Well, Thank you for what you said. Um, I've been in and out of public housing before. I'll be brief. I'm in a spend down situation now, which means I'll have to start all over again to get on a list. My daughter's disabled. She's ready to lose her home north side. But I just want you all to know this problem is going to balloon because our state is now a uh, haven uh, declared officially for queer and transgender people. For example, I am a gay person. My daughter has two new housemates who are fleeing to a couple who have had to sell everything in Missouri who have come here, and other people I know who are leaving their states to come here just to stay alive, to stay alive and to stay out of a, a, a long prison term just for be loving who they love. And the last thing I want to say 
is that I never believed, um, I was a public employee, I never believed that at my age of 75 after surviving cancer and cataract surgery that I would be broke, that I would be dependent every, every single uh, week on food shelves and that I would have to go to food shelves to help feed my daughter. This is absolutely unconscionable and the problem is gonna get much worse very soon. Thank you, Ms. Bowron. Uh, next is Ms. Shirley Brown. Thank you. As, as you've said, um, my name is Shirley Brown. I want to say thank you, Council Persons, for inviting us here and Mayor Fry. Um, I just wanted to say that I've been living in public housing uh, for 25 years. I worked in the as a paraprofessional in Minneapolis Public Schools up until 2016. And public housing is what helped me get through the lean times when there was not, no, any, no work during the summer. Um, and I just wanted to come here and support um, our residents and, and MPHA because it's been a lifeline for me. But we also need that funding for public housing. We need the mill levy reinstated. We got one electrician for 42 high-rises. You know, we've got work orders that are backed up. Um, my, res my, my neighbor downstairs, we've been asking for help, a work order put in for his shower, was walls were bulging, and he was having problems. I'll, I'll quick, quickly stop, but finally, we finally got um, the people to come in and look at it, and he just sent me some pictures today where they went into the walls, there's mold and mildew, and he's right down below me, and he's been living down below me for years. So we really need that funding, and I just hope that we can get that done. Thank you. Thank you for your time and for speaking today. Uh, next looks like we have Ms. Shirley Vincent. Welcome, thank you for being here today. Thank you. I'm here to support our buildings because we need, need all the funds that we can get to uh, make sure that they function for people as the years pass. So I, I lived there for, oh goodness, for well, ever since 07. And I, on the north side, I lived on the north side for 50 years. And then I got in one of the places. I like it. I just want to have more money to fix things that need to be fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Val Labrie. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. And you have Good one afternoon. minute. Good afternoon, Mayor Fry. I'm coming to you to please put the levy back that you promised five years ago, that you would put it back, that was your campaign. We need that money. It's not a budget, it's a tax. It's completely different. We need that. Please put it back that you promised us. I got a whole room full that's gonna start hounding you if you don't get it back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Labrie. Um, let's also make sure we keep our, there's not a problem with your comment. You didn't attack anyone, but let's make sure we all respect each other so that we can work together. But your comment was fine. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Vanderplock? Mr. Vanderplock. I know I didn't pronounce that correctly. Please correct me. Sorry, Vanderplock. Well, I, I, wanna, I love Minneapolis as a wonderful city. I want to support housing. Let's support housing for quality of life. This is such a wonderful city. Everyone deserves good housing. That's a big asset. It's one of the great things about Minneapolis. And I, I, wonderful people I live with, and they all deserve better housing to maintain the, the services and the housing quality that we have and keep going. and get better in better housing, but we need to maintain at least what we have right now and keep it. And I hope uh, the years to come, 
uh, housing is available, so people retire, they're in the military, uh, uh, all works of life, and uh, I, uh, I hope that you pass a levy that, so we can maintain the housing we, we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is, is it Maddie, Miss Maddie? My name is Maddie Henderson, and I spoke in the other room, but this time I just want to um, really talk about ventilation systems uh, where I live, 1710 Plymouth. I've been there for 14 years, and I'm seeing a major difference in our ventilation system where I, I think it seems like they backfired they're supposed to go out, but it's coming in. Mm. A lot of residents are speaking about how they sweep during the day. You get it up, it's right back. The dust is just a mess. I know it takes money. So we need that levy reinstated. We need money from wherever we can get it from because we need help, not just for now, but for the future. We have children, grandchildren. So whatever we can get, we would highly appreciate it. Thank you for that, for those comments. Thank you for being here with us today. Next we have, is it Belinda Wallace? Good Welcome. Afternoon. My name is Belinda Walker and I live um, off of Lindell and Broadway, North Minneapolis. Um, four years ago I was homeless and I signed up for public housing and I'm grateful for it. We have a lot of issues in our building and I know that our um, maintenance is low as far as people working and coming and helping. Sometimes I'm afraid to complain due to the fact that our building might be shut down and I know what it is to be homeless. So I just ask that the levy be passed, you know, so that I don't have the fear and other people's have fear and then also the fact of the light rail coming in that area and how we need security. So we're just asking that you do what you can to help us there. Thank you. Can we silence any phones so we can be respectful of all of our neighbors? Thank you. I know sometimes it's hard to find where it's ringing from, so thank you for doing that. Our next person we have is Ms. Catherine Halleck. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I've been to public housing in a very short time, and it was I'm thankful for it because I couldn't work anymore for medical reasons, and so I finally got into housing. It took a while, but the only sometimes it's really hard to be there because you see things that are broken, and it's like you can't, they can't get fixed it right away. It has to take a long time, and it's and it's sad to see a lot of people say, "Oh well, my shower don't work, or this doesn't work," and it's like you try help them, and you do as much as you can to help each other out. It's you become a community, and it's that's a great thing. But we can, we don't have the money to fix it, so you just do the best that you can. So I'm just hoping that you can give us our tax money so we can get the things fixed that we need and have security. That's one thing in our area is 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 scary because you don't walk outside after five o'clock at night because you're scared, and that's a whole other issue, but thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, Mr. Larry Brown. Hey. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, my name is Larry Brown, and I live at 1710 Plymouth also. And I feel very strongly we need this funding because, hey, that building that I'm living in, I mean, it's, to me, as far as health-wise, you know, it's unsafe. Me, I'm one, I have asthma, I have COPD. And I have allergies up to, yeah. And uh, the building itself, as far as it's been spoken on anyway, by Ms. Manny, for one, the ventilation is ridiculous. 
I mean, I ventilated the vents. I'm supposed to circulate air throughout our apartments, but it's not happening, you know. I mean, and doing, also during the winter, we have to sit in there with our windows closed all winter long. And that does not have a physical condition. It's not good. So we need this funding to better upgrade the building and to make it more secure and safe for the people that live in there. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is Miss Mary. Is it? Thank you for being with us. I'm Mary McGovern, and I'm the president of the Minneapolis High Rise Representative Council. We have 42 high rises in Minneapolis, and we want to preserve these high rises. We want them to last for years and years to come. We have vulnerable adults that need places to live. Before my high rise went through the RAD conversion and was completely remodeled, before that, we had elevator problems, we had flooding. We had apartments that were so bad that the walls had to be redone. Um, we, uh, we need this, this uh, tax levy really, really bad. Uh, we can't, uh, the, you can't even imagine the uptake, uptake and upkeep on all the high rises and all these units. It takes so much money and work to keep them, to keep them updated and everything. We want our residents to feel like they're, they're safe and secure and the ceilings and the walls are not going to fall on top of them. We need this tax levy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes our public comment for today, and I will direct the clerk to receive and file those comments. Um, is there any discussion? Mayor Fry? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I don't have any discussion with regard to the underlying action, which is receipt and file, uh, but I wanted to first say thank you uh, to all of you that have attended today. Uh, the basic ask for habitable conditions, a place that you can live and call home uh, that is well kept, uh, is repaired, and when you have an ask that maintenance needs to take place, it's done timely, those are fair and legitimate asks. Those are asks that need to be met. Uh, and so I, I want to thank you just deeply and uh, I'm going to have a series of questions here that have come out of the, uh, the report that I believe will be presented here shortly. Um, you know, I, I ran for office originally because we cared about affordable housing and we cared about public housing. And you may have heard this. Uh, we have been producing six times more deeply affordable housing units than we did on an annual basis previously. Six times more. Is it enough? No. It's not. We've been providing more funding to uh, public housing uh, than any time in the last, say, 30 years. And actually, we aren't aware of any time that where we have prov provided more funding than we have in this last year. We need to make sure that every one of those dollars goes to you, that you feel the benefit of it. Uh, and we need to make sure that you all have the conditions that you deserve. That's part of the work that's happening here. There are some complexities to get there. And so... Uh, we will do everything possible, not just to get the funding from the city, but you may have heard we've also uh, brought together a coalition of city and county and state and federal people that can help to get even more monies. Because the basic ask that you have to the city can't stop there. Uh, the truth, and you all have probably seen this, is that public housing has been underfunded by the federal government since around when I was born. Since the early 80s, 
Both Democrat and Republican presidents, Democrat and Republican administrations have not properly funded public housing. The city has a role here where we need to step up. And we need to do it thoughtfully and smartly where we're collaborating with other entities as well. Otherwise, we're gonna to continue to see this backlog. We need to lean into some of the difficult solutions and not simplify uh, some of the issues we're facing. Uh, and my pledge is to you, each and every one of you, is that we at the city will do everything possible that we can to make this right, to get the funding, the funding that you need. And so thank you for coming. And I will have a series of questions during the presentation um, just to make sure everything's checking out. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Um, additional comments? All right, I, I'll have one comment myself before we move on. Um, the mayor just mentioned why he ran, and I, I actually want to start with that. Um, I ran for four important reasons. Um, one, my ancestors called me to. Two, my love of the village, which is who raised me. Elders, such as many of you in this room, my community, that's who raised me. I grew up in South Central. I grew up spending a lot of time in public housing. My father still is in South Central, still living in public housing. He takes so much pride when I come to town as his pride, of, pride and joy of his daughter that has been able to, against all odds, make something of myself. And when I go to stay with my father in his public housing, it breaks my heart every time because his food is expired, because they haven't been able to come change a light bulb in seven years, a very special light bulb so he can't see his food. He has a lot of rodents. There are a lot of issues in his apartment. And when I go to visit him as much as I possibly can because all of my family is out on the West Coast and me and my family are here alone, it is incredibly painful to, to be in the place with my father where he wants me to be, but to see him live that way. And he's very independent, much like myself. Um, and so th that's where he wants to be. That, that is our neighborhood. That is our community. That's where we are from. That's where he grew up. Um, and so it's very difficult to see, um, he just had his 74th birthday, that the same conditions that you all are living in, I know it very well because I've been there myself, and my father still lives in those conditions. Um, but I want to also say that we have to keep our faith because when we keep our faith, we remain hopeful. And um, this is not a competition. This isn't about where the money may or may not come from. Any source of funding, all available sources of funding, I am a partner. I'm speaking to you as our community. I'm speaking to all of you as my colleagues. Um, I am a partner. I want to be present. I want to be at the table. I want to work with everyone. Yes, I have my own ideas um, and ideologies, but it's not about that. Um, I sit here and represent the whole city within my seat. Um, and so I will, I'm, I'm sitting here to make sure that I do that. And so I'm available and I, I want to be at the table. Um, the mayor mentioned about the coalition. Count me in in your coalition, mayor. I want to be at the table with you. I want to work with you and everyone else. Um, and I just wanna say that it, it takes a lot. As you see, I'm even getting emotional myself. It takes a lot to be vulnerable and share your story. I do this work for a living every day on the north side, affordable housing work, specifically working with tenants that are living in poor conditions. And so I, I live and breathe this work every single day. Um, and I know how difficult it is to come and share your very personal stories and be vulnerable in that way. Um, but I, we appreciate you coming here today. We see you, we hear you, we value you. Um, and I'm very, very glad that you're here today. You all broke a record today. I'll end with that. In the history of the BET, there's never been more than 10 people that have showed up. Um, if we hadn't have changed our bylaws, my colleagues and I last year, you wouldn't be allowed to be here speaking today because it was only for the, the two charter allowed public hearings that where folks were allowed to speak. Um, and so this is very meaningful and shows that people do actually care. They are actually paying attention. Um, they are starting to learn about the work that we do and how it feeds into the larger infrastructure of our government. Um, and so I think this is actually a testament of our leadership and what happens when we do our work as elected officials to do community engagement and ask for folks to come in to the House of the People so that they could be heard. Um, so thank you to my colleagues. Vice President Brent, did you have anything? Or can we move on? All right. Well, with that being said, please receive and file, um, and we will move on to item number five, which is our housing levy presentation from Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. Welcome, Director Warsami and your team. We're grateful to have you with us today. Looking forward to hearing your presentation.
Thank you for the tissue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President uh, Priestinson and uh, members of the BET. My name is Abdi Wasami. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Laura Dykema, who's uh, head of our planning and development team, and uh, uh, Drew Hallanin, who is our Assistant Director of Communications and Strategic Initiatives. Um, and thanks uh, to MHRC and to the residents of Minneapolis Public Housing Authority who have joined us today as well. We have a, a small presentation, a presentation that we are sharing with council members. Uh, we've met about six council members right now, and we are glad to be sharing this presentation with the members of the Board of Estimate Taxation. And so let me start with the overview. Um, so we're going to uh, cover MPHA housing programs and demographics. Um, we're also going to uh, look at the 2022 agency accomplishments, our new five-year strategic plan, the challenges the agency is facing, and some of the opportunities uh, that, that are in front of us. And I'm going to hand it over to Drew Hallinan to kind of take, take this part. Go ahead, Drew. Thank you, thank you Abby. Uh, and thank you, board. Um, so real quick, you, you look at the slide deck here and, and what's presented on the screen. Uh, MPHA runs three primary programs. Um, on the left is the low-income public housing. This is most commonly recognized by our 42 high-rises across the city. We also have uh, about 184 family homes at Glendale, which are also part of our uh, uh, public housing portfolio, and a 16-unit townhome development. All of that lives on the Section 9 public housing portfolio. That serves about 7,000 um, public housing residents and predominantly in uh, one bedroom and studio apartments um, in those high rises. On uh, the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about demographics, but if you remove Glendale from the equation, it's almost exclusively um, one bedroom and studio apartments in the high rises in our public housing portfolio. In that middle, middle column, you'll see our deeply affordable family housing por uh, portfolio. Um, we've had conversations with many people in this room, um, with residents, and most recently with the state legislature about the importance of this portfolio. MPHA owns and operates over 700 single family, duplex, and fourplex homes across almost every neighborhood in the city of Minneapolis. This serves about 3,100 residents. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more about the demographics, but these homes account for more than 80% of all homes that MPHA has available for families with children. Um, it's an important note here that these homes are not technically uh, public housing, they're not Section 9, but in fact they are in Section 8. So in 2020, the agency converted these port homes from Section 9 over to Section 8 through something called Community Housing Resources, which is our wholly controlled and owned nonprofit, and allows us essentially to be our own Section 8 landlord. And what that did is it allowed us to more than double the amount of federal subsidy we got for serving the same residents with the same protections at the same income levels in the same homes. It's just the funding mechanisms at the federal level benefit Section 8 beyond what they do Section 9. So we took advantage of that tool. Um, the wait list for this portfolio has been as high as 7,500 households recently. So this is the single greatest demand for types of homes that we have within our portfolio. Um, and then, like I said before, these units, even through the conversion, remain deeply affordable, serving the same residents with the same rent portions um, in the same homes. And then finally, Housing Choice Voucher, most commonly known as Section 8. Um, the agency administers about 7,200 vouchers, um, Section 8 vouchers. That benefits about 18,500 individuals. Um, right now, there's about 1,500 individuals that are on the Section 8 waiting list, and that waiting list hasn't been open since 2019. When we do open those wait that waiting list, we see thousands of individuals get onto that waiting list pretty quickly, so we spend time working down the list before we open it up again. So quick snapshot of just kind of the demographics, and like I mentioned before, on that left side in that low-income public housing, if you were to remove Glendale, and that's why you see 16% of the, the population living in public, public housing is under the age of 18, that's almost exclusively from Glendale. We don't have a lot of children living in the high-rises. Um, so if you remove that, what you're seeing is uh, low rates of earned income, high rates of fixed income, uh, high rates of disabled. So you see 59% household head of household disabled. So we have a, a large disabled uh, population, over half of whom are 62 or plus or elderly. Um, and then those household size, over 60% of them are single households. So again, uh, older, um, a large disabled community, uh, fixed income um, living in, in our high rises. That middle portfolio, that's our family housing. I'd point out a few things there. First is it's 87% uh, black African-American families served in these homes. 85% uh, of these homes are led by a female. Uh, there are much higher rates of earned uh, income uh, in these homes. You see a, a lower rate of disabled. But two very important things is over half of the children, or excuse me, over half of the individuals served by this portfolio of homes, 3,100 people, are children under the age of 18. 
And it, you'll also see that almost two thirds of all households in this portfolio of homes are families of five or more. So whenever you hear us talk about scattered sites, whenever you hear us say CHR, what we are talking about is young black families with children. So that's what that portfolio reflects there. And then the far right, our housing choice voucher, it's closer to the deeply affordable family housing portfolio in, it, it, in its demographics. There's some uniqueness there, but um, just some more information about that. I won't drain this slide. I won't spend too much time on this slide. Um, but, but quickly, the agency in the last year, um, there's been many great accomplishments. It started from getting a $2 million federal pro direct federal appropriation from our federal delegation um, to help install fire suppression systems. We completed. I know we have Mary McGovern here, um, the $27 million Rad Litech renovation of the Elliott Twins, the largest of its kind in the city of Minneapolis. And we actually had the HUD secretary in August of last year come visit. And she actually held this project up as an example of, of success nationwide. And Mary, I don't know if she ever took you up on the offer, but she offered to fly Mary around the country to help talk to other housing authorities about rad conversions because the way that the agency took uh, just a hands-on approach with residents and making sure there was minimal resident disruption and residents were at the center of every part of uh, the decision-making process in the RAD conversion. Um, and then finally, the agency during uh, COVID helped 750 unique families receive 2.5 million in rent relief programs through Rent Help Minnesota. We have a housing stability team in-house. Um, we closed on our 84 new units of deeply affordable family housing. And then last year, and thank you to the mayor and to his colleagues on the council, um, the agency was able to secure an unprecedented $4.9 million in direct funding on the city's 2023 fiscal year 2023 budget. Um, 3.7 was for repairs in our family housing portfolio and bringing some family housing online. And then also 1.2 million was the final funding necessary to install fire suppression systems in all 42 high rises. Work that is ongoing and work that we anticipate having completed by the end of 2025, having fire suppression systems in all 42 high rises. Thank you, Drew. And uh, members of the BET, I just wanted to kind of cover, our, uh, we have a new strategic plan a five-year plan, and we have uh, six clear goals. Uh, the first goal is to provide and preserve deeply affordable, high-quality housing for high-rise residents. Today, the folks who have showed up, who have testified, are folks who live in our high-rises. We have 42 high-rises. This is a key infrastructure of uh, the city and the agency. Our second goal is to build new and expanded partnerships with federal, state, and local governments, in addition to philanthropic entities who support MPHA residents and those on the agency waiting list. We thank the mayor for putting together a work group made up of different uh, jurisdictions in order to find funding for MPHA. Um, so that's one of our goals, to come here to present, to make our case, and to uh, uh, tell us our story. The third is uh, to provide and preserve deeply affordable, high-quality family housing. On top of our high-rises, we do have uh, a large portfolio of family housing, both in Glendale as well as our scatter sites, and we want to make sure we preserve them. Uh, we have an ask at the state of $45 million. The mayor has helped us, and, and council members as well as uh, the, the commissioners have also sent letters of support. And um, uh, preserving that family deeply affordable housing is a key to our uh, strategic plan. Uh, the fourth one is increase the supply of deeply affordable housing by at least 150 units per year. Um, this is, uh, you know, some of the success we've had and the city has had in uh, providing deeply affordable 30% AMI and below housing has been because of the voucher program that MPHA provides through our project-based voucher program. We intend to, uh, uh, we have an ambitious goal of 150 new units every year and we believe we can achieve that. Um, the other two are mainly internal for the agency, position MPHA as an employer of choice. We're a very diversified uh, workforce um, with high rates of uh, people of color as well as uh, female participation. And we wanna make sure that we retain the talent that we have, we also recruit more talent. Um, to continue to improve uh, agency performance to retain MTW status and highest HUD performing rating. A MPHA across the country is a very high performing public housing agency. Um, we've just had a, a federal inspections and we scored 98.5% on a rate of 100. Our occupancy rate is 98%. Um, and we are also one of the first, what they call MTW agencies. And MTW is an acronym that HUD provides moving to work. We're very proud of that, uh, that, that status because it allows us to be flexible with the funding that we get for the federal government. Um, so we want to maintain being a high performing agency and we continue to do so. Um, from the strategic plan, we identified four main priorities. Uh, people, be people-centric, make sure that we uh, center all our work around the people that we serve and also the people that do the service, uh, to preserve uh, the, the, the valuable housing stock that we have. I've always said that I 
I view our housing stock as a key city infrastructure, like the streets, like the utility system, like the parks. So we need to preserve them. Um, we do house 5% of the city, estimate 5% of the city's population on any given night. Um, production, we need to produce more, 150 units, the 84 units that we're producing, even with our, uh, our RAD conversion at the Elliott's, we preserved 174 units, but we added 10 extra units there as well. And then finally, partnerships, you know, partnerships with the city, with the county, with the state, uh, deeper partnerships with our federal uh, government, as well as the philanthropic and business community of the city of Minneapolis. And then uh, the MPHA, the biggest challenge we're facing is our capital backlog. The mayor mentioned, uh, um, you know, for the last 30, 40 years, we have been, uh, you know, de-invested uh, by the federal government. Our current capital backlog is around $210 million. Um, you know, we have 42 high-rises, which were built in the late 60s and early 70s, so there's a challenge there. Also, our family housing ranges from 10 years to 100 years. Um, so that's another challenge there, with a note that Glendale, um, uh, our, our row houses, our townhomes in the Glendale neighborhood in Prospect Park is celebrating its 70th, 70th anniversary this year. Um, and then, historically, we get 10 cents for every dollar. You heard the testimony of our residents. There's always a challenge. There's always a, a, a backlog. There's always a problem, you know, because we, for the money that we need from the federal government, we get 10 cents for every dollar. That has been around 10 to 20 million annually when our capital backlog is $210 million. Now, if we rely just on what we're getting from the federal government, uh, we estimate that the capital backlog will balloon to, to $403 million by the year 2043, which means some of these units will be lost and there will be involuntary displacement of our residents. And now I'm going to hand it over to uh, PND Director Laura Dyko. Thank you, Abdi. Um, I want to talk more in depth about our capital fund challenges. Um, due to the magnitude of our backlog, uh, the agency is constantly triaging a growing list of capital needs. The $210 million backlog only represents what we need today to maintain um, our existing portfolio. That figure doesn't reflect resources that we need to address future capital needs of the existing portfolio. It doesn't include enhancements to our units that we want to make livability enhancements, energy efficiency improvements, accessibility improvements, and other amenities. And it also doesn't reflect the dollars that we need to expand our portfolio to address uh, the need of affordable housing in our community. Um, while we want to do more, we primarily utilize our scarce federal resources to address those capital needs. And many of our needs are building systems and infrastructure, things like plumbing, electrical. You heard from some of our residents about plumbing that's leaking. Um, we also have ventilation is another concern of ours in our, in our buildings, as well as fire systems, elevators, roofs, windows, facades. Those are, uh, make up a large portion of our needs, and the graph on the right there shows how we've been spending our capital dollars, and you'll see that's a lot of what we've been spending our resources on. Um, those are actually pictures of pipes that we uh, that failed plumbing that have been removed from our uh, high-rises and recently replaced. So you can see they're not in great condition. Um, again, while important, addressing these needs do not necessarily address the quality of life. Residents don't necessarily, they know that their plumbing is working, but it doesn't really address quality of life. Therefore, we really need these additional non-federal resources to not only address these needs, but to do more. We have really maximized uh, tools available and resources available to us um, to address these capital needs. Um, due to its high performance status, uh, Director Warsami mentioned we're moving to work authority. Only 39 other housing authorities across the agency have that uh, designation. And it allows us to pool our resources that we receive from the federal government and apply them to the different programs uh, where we see the, the, the biggest need. And so over the past several years, we have received a, a, the capital fund grant, but we have been allocating additional resources to address capital needs between three and five million dollars annually um, to, to really try to tackle those capital needs. We have utilized HUD conversion tools. Uh, Drew was talking about the conversions that we've done with both our, our scattered sites, where we more than double our annual federal subsidy by doing the Section 18 conversion of those properties. And we also used HUD's uh, rental assistance demonstration program 
to do the conversion at the Elliott Twins. That unlocked our ability to utilize traditional funding sources like low-income housing tax credits and debt to finance the, the major improvements, almost $30 million worth of improvements um, to those buildings. So we have been maximizing um, those tools as well. Um, the, the state's publicly owned housing program bonds, we have um, secured more than $7 million um, of those resources in the past several years. But that, that program does pose challenges to us. We are not allowed to utilize HUD conversion tools at those properties where we have used the debt to, to finance improvements at those properties. So it comes with some limitations. Again, we talked about uh, the city resources, state, county, and Met Council resources that we have secured in recent years to help address both our capital needs, but to, to also assist in our conversion projects and also expansion projects, most recently the family housing expansion project. And also with tax credits and bonds, the city has allocated those resources to our most recent projects. But those resources um, are also scarce and also highly competitive. Um, we also have mentioned the $45 million cash grant that we are pursuing with the state um, to help address the capital needs of our family housing, uh, or I'm sorry, our CHR portfolio. Um, we're actively pursuing that. And there's been a number of other th things that we have done outside of this not listed here. We've taken advantage of HUD's energy performance contracting program. We replaced all of our high-rise boilers and did a number of other energy efficiency upgrades about 10 years ago through that program. We've also secured other grants from HUD, including a safety and security grant, as well as a lead-based paint abatement grant where we made all of our scattered site homes um, lead safe. So we've been utilizing all of these tools, but it's just really not enough. And, you know, we believe it's time for bold action uh, to change the course. You know, MPHA, as mentioned, uh, is, has pursued an all of the above approach in seeking new funding and partners to help address our capital backlog. The agency has made progress, and we secured tens of millions of dollars in one-time funding and ongoing funding support, but it's not enough. This issue cannot be seen as solely a federal government responsibility anymore. I and mean, we hear that, you know, this is the responsibility of the federal government, but we're only getting 10, 10 cents for every dollar that we need from the federal government. Um, thankfully, as evidenced by Mayor Fry's public housing preservation and expansion convening, there is a growing understanding that bold local action is necessary. MPHA is a public housing authority by and for the city of Minneapolis, with its board appointed entirely by the mayor and the city council. On any given night, MPHA helps house nearly 5% of the city's population. The agency's nearly 6,000 units are a critical city infrastructure, and they require, a commiserate, commiserate, they require investment from the city of Minneapolis. I beg your pardon. Uh, the mayor and the city council have the statutory authority to fund the housing levy, which would send MPHA an estimated $12 million a year in new funding. The time for action is now. Now, in terms of the housing levy, uh, a little bit of history. Uh, per state statute, the mayor and the city council can approve a housing levy up to 0.0185% of the city's estimated market value. In 2023, that would have been $12 million. This levy is separate from the city's tax levy and exists as a special district levy in Hennepin County. Um, until 2009, Minneapolis used a part of the housing levy to help MPHA exclusively meet security concerns. Um, much has changed since that time, since 14 years. The city's affordable housing crisis has worsened. Um, HUD has created new leveraging tools that allows housing authorities to leverage um, and, and finance uh, uh, the preservation and, new, and, the, and the production of new unit. Uh, MPHA has you know, developed in-house capability of developing. Uh, we have had success in the, uh, the conversion of the Elliots, and we are also uh, embarking on a, a project for our 84 units. Further, nearly 100 localities across Minnesota are now using the Housing Levy Authority with great success. Um, go ahead. Director Warsami, before you continue, Mayor Fry had a specific question on that slide. Let, if we could go back, yep, and this then one? Mayor Fry, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Director Warsami, and uh, uh, I, NPHA, thank you for being here. Um, 
I have questions actually about both this slide as well as the next one. Um, why don't we start with the previous one, if that's all right? Uh, so it talks about until 2009, Minneapolis used a housing level to levy to help MPHA meet security expenses. Uh, do you know what the maximum amount received under that levy was? We believe it was around 20% uh, of the maximum amount levy. And it was around a million dollars that used to go to basically security guards. So it was, so when we talk about replenishing the levy or restoring the levy, um, you're not suggesting that the levy was previously at the $12 million figure because the highest amount that we have seen previously was $1.2 million in total. Yes, I mean, I, I'm, we're saying that if you were to allow us to have the maximum levy of 0.0185%, that would equate to $12 million. So historically, MPHA never got the full access to the levy. Thank you. And the, do you have the total amount that we were able to fund last year uh, apart from the levy? Because, of course, you can fund through the levy, you can fund not through the levy. It, it's the same amount of money, ultimately, that you would get. Mm -hmm. um, do you know the amount of funding that we were able to provide MPHA last year in 2023? I think we put that in our uh, accomplishments um, in 2023, which was one of the slides that we had, which we believe it was, and we said it is unprecedented, it's historic, and it was 4.9 million. So in beyond the, the 4.9 million, uh, there was also additional ongoing funding that has been provided before then. It's about 3.3 million between the work of the deeply affordable uh, housing preservation, the MPHA security monies that we provided, uh, and also the $2.2 million, which is a partnership around stable homes, stable schools. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's around 3.3 additional million dollars that, that wasn't accounted for. Uh, and then that doesn't include the uh, further amounts that we've allocated through things like ARPA, uh, 2023 operating budget, and other, other time appropriations as well. So I just wanted to make sure it was clear to, to people when you, know, when, when you do funding, um, we have been providing funding at, as far as we can tell, a record level. Um, uh, you know, is that funding enough to meet the needs? No, it is not. Um, but the city has been stepping up. Yeah, I mean, I would say... Uh to uh, Mayor Fry's point, the Mayor Fry administration has been, you know, has stepped up, has provided resources to MPHA, but just like the mayor said, it's not enough, and that's why we think this tool would help address that gap that we that we see today. Well, do, you, do you want to do the presentation, or do you want to? Why don't you do the question? presentation on this slide? I do have a few questions about this slide, though. Okay, go ahead. You know, so I'll jump in in a second. Uh, yeah. Information you're looking at here is from the Minnesota Department of Revenue, um, and this is looking at the different housing levies administered throughout the state. Uh, and you'll see Minneapolis is actually at zero. Um, there are a few others that are at zero around the state, so Clay County, Morris, Moundsview, Sandstone, and Roseville. Um, the remaining almost 100 um, are all using their levying authority to some degree. So this is numbers from last year, and you see that percent levy change, so that was from the percent change from the 2022 levy to the 2023 proposed levy in these different localities. Madam Chair, this is actually the part that I had a question about, if, if I may. Um, so are, are, are you suggesting here that these amounts written down that were provided through the respective HRA levies went to public housing in these other jurisdictions? We are not, no. Uh, so, I mean, the, the thing we're talking about now is money is to public housing. Um, and if we're talking about monies to public housing, Minneapolis wasn't at zero. In fact, last year we were somewhere around 15.8 million. If we're talking about the HRA levy to public housing, do you know if any of these other jurisdictions provided money to public housing? Let's see, I think St. Paul's. I don't know that answer off the top of my head. No, I do not. So, I mean, so Eden Prairie, for instance, it says that they gave $205,000 through the HRA lever. Did public housing residents get a single dollar of that? that the answer to that question would be contingent on whether or not even Eden Prairie had That's owned public, public housing units, yeah. which is actually rather uncommon in places outside of the Twin Cities metro. And what about Dakota County? Dakota County has a pretty substantial amount of money there. Did any of that, any of those dollars go to public housing? I 
do not know the answer if they went to public housing. Again, public housing units are not something that are particularly common outside. Of I, I think what you know when we talk about helping people, we're talking about helping public housing residents. We're talking about money going directly to public housing. And what I would hate for people to think is that that the comparison and the juxtaposition set up here was that all of these other counties and cities were giving money to public housing when many are not. In fact, you know, it'll say $2.2 million going, up, going to the HRA level when zero dollars actually went to public housing residents. So if, again, if we're creating the juxtaposition here, I just think we need to be operating with, with full information and transparency about what the numbers actually mean. If I can answer, uh, directly, since, you know, the, the uniqueness of MPHA is one in size. Half of, you know, uh, the public housing units in, across, the, across the state is probably located in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Second of all, the capital backlog, the entire capital backlog of public housing and deeply affordable housing across the state of Minnesota is around, estimated to be, from NARO, around $380 million. $210 million of those is just Minneapolis public housing. Agreed. So in terms of size, in terms of the population that we serve, there is no comparison across the state. However, what you have here is these jurisdictions are funding. They're equivalent to the public housing residents that live in their districts. These are the most vulnerable populations that the HRA is serving, and those are the 30% AMIs and below. For example, MPHA now has a portfolio that is non-public housing, but they're still residents of MPHA. The Elliott Twins is part of that. The Scatter Sites is part of mm -hmm. that. So I think the issue here is this. MPHA has uh, the, the authority, if the mayor and the council allows, for us to get a specific uh, funding source that other jurisdictions are funding their most vulnerable populations. So I think the, the, the terms might be public housing and residents, but they are funding their localities because that state statute is there to fund those kind of programs. M Madam uh, Chair, uh, Council Member Warsami, just to correct it though, the dollars themselves don't necessarily go to public housing at all. In fact, the ones that we've looked at, um, these other jurisdictions are not, are not given any money to public housing specifically. Now, like we do, uh, they uh, fund down payment assistance uh, for people of lower incomes. Uh, like we do, they might have an infrastructure project or a capital backlog project that's met. The difference here, which is not referenced, is that we have a separate CPED organization that used to be MDCA, now it's CPED, where we are able to fund a lot of these things through that. We're able to get public housing money through that. It's not zeroed out. We're able to get public housing money on an ongoing basis through that. We're able to build affordable housing units through that. And so I just wanted to clarify that, I mean, the juxtaposition here makes it look like Minneapolis doesn't do anything for public housing, whereas these other entities do a lot. In fact, if you look at the data, the vast majority of the time, it's exactly the opposite. Okay. I mean, we stand by our data and research, and what we have is a state statute that allows MPHA to get this resource, and we're not right now accessing it, and we believe this tool will help us address the challenges that you heard today from our residents. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Thank you, Director Asami. Before you go on, I, I just want to make a comment. Um, I feel that's a, a little recentering. I, I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but but I just want to name that yes, absolutely. Um, I heard the mayor's address. Um, I w attended the budget address. We are indeed doing all of those things, and we are making monumental investments. But that's still we are still very very behind because we're we're talking about the backlog of public housing. But we're you mentioned earlier that it was uh, black people, the African diaspora, that mostly makes up public housing, but we also have a lot of native folks. Everybody matters, don't get me wrong. But I am also saying that this is a city that suffers from deep inequity, racial inequities. And it, so we're, yes, well, uh, we are making large gains and that's not anything to, to argue about. That is fact and it is real and it is great. We're going all the way back to redlining of trying to right, make right for, for things that were done wrong, for things that we inherited that we now own having to make these decisions for. And while these funds, I think it was somewhere between 14 and 16 million um, last year that was specific to public housing. I have specifics, but I'm gonna let you do your presentation. I, I just wanna, 
I want us all to be mindful and reflective on the fact that we're, we're going back for hundreds of years of disparities, and it's the people that are suffering from those disparities that are the primary residents of the housing that we're talking about. Um, and so I just, I just wanna, I, I wanna center us in that and just reflect on the fact that while we're talking about these investments, we still have a really, really, really long way to go because again, it's the tie of, of the historical harm that was done and the primary communities that are now um, asking for these resources um, who are specifically now suffering, um, who are in this particular type of housing. There is a correlation between that. Mm. Um, the data is not in this presentation because we're focused on the numbers and this is a numbers body, but I also just wanna name and lift up that that is uh, critically important and that we should center it and reflect on it. Yeah. And, 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 and um, uh, President uh, Priestinson, to, I want to make a, a point that the mayor has addressed. We're not doubting that the city of Minneapolis gives us money like project by project. What this gives us is the ability to plan for the future. And we were going to talk about that. And also, we interface with, because we have such a large, vulnerable population, we interface with the city in many different ways. The mayor mentioned stable homes, stable schools. We have children who are vulnerable, who are facing homelessness, and we've worked with the city, and that we got funding for that program. We have other challenges that we face. We, when we do a development, we come to the city and we get one-time funding. So yes, that's fine, but we don't get reliable resources that we can plan for from the city of Minneapolis that allows us to, very, to target some of the challenges we're facing. And that's what this tool allows us to do. Go ahead. Thank you for your questions on that, Data Mayor Frey, and also for your clarification. And I think we are, no, nope, Council Member Kos. Thank you, President Priestinson. Thank you for being here. And I just want to start out by saying, um, yes, I mean, we need good quality housing and everyone deserves that. And I agree with that full heartedly. And I, uh, and I commit to figuring out what the best solutions and tools are uh, to get us there. And I also want to just thank uh, all of you for being here today and ex uh, just expressing your experiences. It, it does, it means a lot. Um, I think you answered this though, actually, after I put myself in queue, but I just wanna give you another opportunity. I just wanna hear, you know, this tool, um, I would just, you know, why this tool um, versus how we are currently funding? And when I just heard the mayor and uh, our president here state that we funded you at, uh, you know, I think he said 15.8 million um, versus this would be up to 12 million, I heard you say, reliability and consistency, mm -hmm. but could you also, is there another reason because that is not funding you as much as we have already actually in this last mm -hmm. year? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the thing is, I think this, the one-time projects will still continue. So the one-time, stable home, stable school will still get funded. Um, the one-time projects will still be there, tax credits, all of those things. What this tool does though, it gives us reliable income year by year that we can depend on, that we can plan for. Last year, we had on the budget one-time funding. So we had $3.7 million in one-time funding to go to one specific project. Next year, we have to go back. We don't know what we'll get, maybe two million, maybe one million. There is no consistency in the resource that's coming in that allows us to plan for. So I think that's where this tool is a little bit different because it's a reliable resource that, can come, that comes in that we can work on. And the city can say to us, okay, you're getting 12 million, maybe you're not gonna get this and maybe you can fund that. But what it does for us is we know we can plan for it. Maybe we go and borrow on it and bond on it and do large projects like Glendale, like Heritage Park, like some of the challenges we're facing. So it's a different type of tool. The city has funded us, yes, but not 15 million every year. You know, if you go back a couple of years, we were getting zero money. It was uh, when I came on MPHA, working with the mayor's office, that we got $1 million ongoing funding. That's all we have, $1 million ongoing funding. So that's all we can rely on. That one million is gonna come in, what do we do with it? Do we use it for sprinklers? Do we use it for windows? Do we use it for, to put down something on a, on a house? But that, what we're saying is, if we had the full funding of, of the levy, we can rely on $12 million a year, plan for, do some larger projects, while still working with uh, the city to, to solve some of the other problems. It, this in itself is not a panacea. It doesn't solve, it's not a silver bullet, it doesn't take care of the $210 million backlog. It doesn't take care of all the pressure that we're seeing, but it alleviates some of them for us and for our residents. Vice President Brandt, followed by Mayor Fry.
I speak today as somebody who views this as perhaps the most compelling consequential decision that we'll make as a Board of Estimate in this term. Um, I've been hearing about the backlog in maintenance and renovations at public housing since the 1980s. And I've been in some of the units that uh, people here uh, are talking about. Um, I think that um, this job on the Board of Estimate is a matter of balancing. And we're balancing the needs that are identified by the city and we're balancing the ability of our residents to pay. And uh, looking ahead to 2024, the city council and mayor in their wisdom signed off on a 6.2% property tax increase. Um, by my back of the envelope calculations, adding 12 million to that would push the increase up to 8.9%. And uh, the park board also would like to add a, a parkway uh, uh, spending uh, proposal that would push the total impact up over to 10%. Now, the mayor is the person who proposes the budget, and he may go higher, he may go lower than all those. But I suspect that when the city's tax capacity increased by 1.9% in the past year, asking for an increase at that level is going to generate considerable pushback, and I'll be balancing that against the very real needs that your constituents here um, have identified today. And that leads to the question, uh, could you really, in 2024, put $12 million to work if you got it? Or would you need to ramp up your capacity to administer that much work? And alternatively, have you thought about feathering in an increase in the levy to reduce the annual impact? You know, that, uh, uh, Mr. Brand, um, I think you... You make a compelling argument, and I, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't wish to be in any of your shoes as elected officials to make these decisions, let alone the mayors. Uh, but for us, we have to advocate for our residents. The park board comes here and advocates for its residents and asks for a specific amount because the parks are important. You know, um, we're here because our residents are important. The 42 high rises, the 6,000 units that we have are important, and the challenge that we're facing in this city. I think there are two main challenges, and I know you're aware of it. One is public safety. It's a big challenge, and these residents are facing that challenge. The other is housing, and I live in Cedar Riverside, and every day there are camps, uh, encampments that are, they, they go away, they come back, they go away. They, you know, it's like a little game that's being played in our neighborhood, and it affects our children. I'm also a homeowner, and I pay taxes too. So we understand the challenge, but it's what is the priority for the city of Minneapolis? Who are the priority for the city of Minneapolis? And if your budget is a moral document, where does it stand when it comes to the most vulnerable population? 28,000 vulnerable people, 80% who happen to be black. Now, if this infrastructure fails, and we've seen what happened with the Navigation Center, we see what happened with some of the slum laws that you know, couldn't, are unable to house people, we know what happens when involuntary displacement of residents happen. It costs the city more money to house those people. So what we're saying is let's keep this infrastructure Let's keep these folks whole. Let's add a little bit over time, and it's going to cost the city of Minneapolis, the average home household, fifty dollars a year. So again, that's the balance, and I'm not. That's not my job. My job here is to advocate and to let you know what are challenges that we're facing and what the challenges our residents are facing today. To follow up, um, you touched on a point that I was going to bring up, and I've always been a believer that when it comes to public infrastructure, and certainly public housing is public infrastructure, along with roads and sewers and so on, uh, your first priority should be to take care of what you have before you add more. Um, if I read your presentation right, um, you're proposing to use the amount of dollars that this would generate uh, both to add units and to um, repair what you have. Do you know roughly what the proportional split of dollars, if you got, say, $240 million that you're asking for, would be between taking care of what you have versus adding? Remember, Brand, we're not asking for $240 million. So, so we're, not, we're not asking for $240 million. So that's one. 
Um, and also, so what's the proportion in terms of preservation to production? Well, preservation, of course, would be our top priority, but we do, I mean, every, every project presents opportunities, and the new unit production numbers can vary, but we would try to target at least producing another 400 or more units um, with, with these dollars. Now, I, don't, I can't tell you today what the price tag is of that, um, because we would also leverage these dollars to bring in other resources to stretch the dollars further. So it wouldn't be necessarily just the full 240 million or the annual amount that would go towards new unit production. We would leverage those funds to bring in other resources to be able to accomplish new unit production at the same time as preservation. And, and to, to add to Laura's point, most of the new unit production is gonna be done through partnerships with developers, for-profit and non-profit developers through the project-based vouchers. So a lot of it is not us actually creating the physical units. We will be providing the subsidy to the developers so then they can, it can help them uh, develop the units. So majority of the work will be preservation. And then it depends on the challenges we're facing. But the main thing here is reliable resources that we can plan for on an annual basis. We don't have that right now from the local governments. Can you update me on what the status is of the Glendale um, proposal? It was going to be, I believe, a RAD project going back to when I was still working. And um, I know there was a lot of pushback, um, a lot of fear uh, from some of the residents, but um, that would seem to be an obvious solution to some of the financial issues that you're dealing with, but it hasn't moved forward, has it? Now, Glendale has not moved forward because Glendale is a, is, a, is a very important project, but we need to make sure that we deal with the community engagement in a much more thoughtful and a long-term process. But Glendale presents a lot of challenges. Which one of the challenges is, and that's why we need to plan for it, is it is in an area of opportunity. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an affluent area. It's 14 acres. You have residents who are afraid of displacement, but we also have an opportunity to add. And I think we've, we've made some inroads with our residents because of the success that we've had at the Elliott Twins and, uh, and the 84 unit construction where we've had deeper engagement with residents. We made sure that nobody was displaced. Uh, we've kept to our promises. So I think we are building those relationships, but Glendale is gonna need a lot of resources and a lot of money. And we don't have that right now, but we're planning for it. I want to clarify what the ask is then, because um, I read this as 12 million a year for 20 years. Um, and uh, I wondered how much additional with that kind of spending and the proportional split that you'd have between preservation mm -hmm. and development you would expect to leverage through, say, low income housing tax credits or debt. Forward. Yeah, I can't. I can't that directly but we do know there is a, a lot of opportunity it also depends on the availability of low-income housing tax credits and bonding uh, available to us um, but again we would aim to uh, produce at least 400 or more new units with these dollars leveraging other resources to do that and going back to the chart showing the PHAs around the state and I appreciate the uh, points the mayor raised um, in, in defense of what the city's already doing. Uh, have you parsed the numbers uh, for a representative sample of these uh, HRAs to see how much has gone to the housing side? They also have the ability to do redevelopment, I believe, with this levy. Yeah, so we can talk a little bit. Yeah, so I appreciate that question. Thank you. Um, Member Brandt, and thank you, Mayor, for this question, because it's actually, it is the next slide, is highlighting some of the ways that this HRA levy is used in some of these localities, in this housing levy. So in neighboring St. Louis Park, they use the full maximum allowable amount for their levy. Um, you see there, the activities include pr preservation and production of affordable housing, rental assistance programs, home ownership assistance to low and, uh, low and moderate income families, and then just covering some agency operational expenses. Um, pushing out a little farther, Carver County, they use their max, max allowable amount. Again, operational expenses, their uh, afforded bonding authority, which we don't have, so it's a little bit different, um, and supportive housing programs. Um, up in Duluth, uh, 1.5 million um, 
is the total amount for an 81% of max allowable amount. Again, you see preservation of affordable housing, supporting new housing development, high-rise security contracts, Section 8 administrative co costs. So all the, the work associated with much of the work that MPHA does, it's, it's similarly reflected. It might not be specifically to public housing, but it's, it works hat in hand in the same, in the same, same spectrum. But the, these examples are obviously all housing, but are there, uh, have you parsed out in your list the amount that goes to non-housing redevelopment activity? So like it's the housing and development. redevelopment levy. Uh, so that suggests two purposes. Redevelopment can be housing or it can be non-housing. I'm just wondering if you've uh, parsed these, out. These are mainly for housing. Yeah, the information that we have presenting for you today is all related to housing. Okay. And going uh, back to your response to the mayor um, about predictability, it sounds to me what you're asking for is the equivalent of what the park board got with its 20-year mm -hmm. neighborhood parks program, some certainty, and what the city's paving project got when uh, you when were on the council, yes. Director Warsami, of some predictability in the amount that was going to be planned could be planned on for the next, for the coming years and i guess that would be the value of doing it through the levy as opposed to the way that the city has handled it to date i think you you're correct um, what we need is a 20 year funding that allows us to tackle some of the biggest challenges we're facing the levy allows us to get our own resources that we can plan for that we can work with Obviously, in our strategic plan, actually, it does say go for the maximum levy or an equivalent. So there could be an equivalent as well. But what we're presenting here is, again, we're not, we know there's no vote here, but we're presenting to you and to the council members and to the mayor is the power that this levy can have in order to address some of the challenges we're seeing. And what we're seeking is collaboration, right? What we're seeking is this is a tool that is in front of you that can be a game changer for MPHA and preserve this key infrastructure in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. You're not done with your presentation, am I correct? No. Uh, Mayor Frey, if your question can't wait, we could do it now, but we, we usually let people allow for people to finish their presentations. We only go a couple of slides, but we can questions. always but defer to if, the mayor. If it's burning, we can do it, but if, if we it's, could wait, that would be cool. It's, but. it's burning and, and, and relevant, and I'll, I'll be as quick as I, as I possibly can here. Thank so, you. so first, I just wanted to clarify that these HRA levies don't necessarily go to public housing and don't necessarily go to housing at all, just to be very clear. So for instance, Dakota County, None of that $9 million, and we checked it out, goes to public housing. Zero dollars of the $9 million goes to public housing. And some of it is just to general economic development, not to affordable housing or any other kind of housing. And so I don't know what the breakdown is from these other jurisdictions. The big difference here is that in Minneapolis, I mean, if you were to, if you were to, to get the dollar figure that we have devoted in the last year to housing, it would be $42.6 million dollars. I mean, even accounting on a per capita basis for housing, we're doing far more than these other entities, even on a per capita basis. Um, I'm just trying to get to the apples to apples comparison here. Um, cause, so no, HRA levies do not mean specifically housing. They could mean housing, but they could also mean beyond housing. No, HRA levies does not mean that the money is going to public housing residents. I just think this is important for public housing residents around the state to understand. Just because it says it's an HRA levy does, on these does not mean it goes to public housing. It does not mean that it's going to housing. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, if I may ask you, and I know you did some research, and we want to sh if you can share that research with us, that would be helpful as we well. Will. We will. But can you tell me how many public housing units are in Dakota County? Uh, Dakota County does have public housing units. However, they're not anywhere close to the amount that Minneapolis has. The, I'm just trying to get to a apples to apples comparison here. And if zero dollars are going to public housing, I don't want how it to many, be... How many do they have? I mean, in, in terms of, if Dakota County had it public housing, we believe this funding would go to their public housing. But they probably converted a lot of their public housing, and now they call it deeply affordable Section 8 housing. And in that slide, we say, we show in there that the money is used for deeply affordable housing. So it does probably go to their deeply affordable housing, but they don't have public housing, so therefore there's no comparison. 
They're right. I would, and I, so what I'm trying to say here, if there is no comparison, let's not make a comparison so, where it doesn't so exist. So the comparison we would make, though, is that money goes to the lowest income residents of the uh, of Dakota right. County. And this money would go to the lowest resident uh, in, in, lowest income residents of Minneapolis, which would be the folks that live in public housing. Agreed. Agreed. No, no, there's no disagreement on that. The, the, the disagreement is that... So our comparison... It, no, if you would, let me finish. Go ahead. The, director. The, the, the disagreement is that we should, we should do the apples to apples comparison in full. And so if we're looking at the amount of monies that are going to housing, not exclusive to public housing, to housing, we should look at the monies that are contributed by Minneapolis to housing and public housing. If we're looking at Dakota County, for instance, there's no breakdown of what of that is going to public, and there's no breakdown of what is going to housing. I just I think that we should be super transparent right now because a lot of times, you know, people will say, "Oh, we're going to give the money to public housing," and you know how much goes to public housing? Zero. Or we're going to give money to affordable housing generally, and you know how much goes to public housing? Zero. And so I'm standing up for residents of public housing to, to statewide here to say, let's not give credit for monies going to public housing when at least in the Dakota County case, zero dollars went there. We can look at Duluth, and we can look at Carver, and we can look at St. Louis Park as well to determine how much actually went to public housing. That's the topic we're talking about Even today. If, have to if we want to expand it further to all affordable housing, mm -hmm. then let's expand it further to all affordable housing and acknowledge what we have also done, just like we would acknowledge what these other cities have done. I'm just trying to get to the apples to apples comparison here. But Mr. And Mayor, again, this data is correct because a lot of these jurisdictions don't have public housing. Correct. They've done their conversions. Now they have Section 8, just like what we did with our scatter sites. And what they're using the levy for is to help those residents. We have public right. housing residents. And I guarantee you, that if we got this levy, and I you know you, the commitment you were making just now, if we got this levy, it would go to our public housing residents. It would go to MPHA and we would go to our residents. So there is no gray area here. This, what we presented is these jurisdictions don't necessarily have public housing, but what they did is they converted their public housing, and now they're using that money to go to those residents. Again, it's the lowest income residents of their tr jurisdiction. Tr uh, that is probably in part true, but some of this money, just to be clear, didn't go to housing at all. Well, that's fine. They, sh they, should, take it, they should give it to housing. And so we should just decipher out. All I'm asking for is let's get a breakdown so that we've got a clear juxtaposition. So I, I just had one quick question okay. here. Okay, before and, we do that, and, though, I just want to say this is now kind of turned into a back and forth, and I want to recenter yeah, us because the presentation isn't done. You came here to present. You came here to ask for collaboration, you said. Mm -hmm. Perhaps maybe there's an ask. Um, I know you all have a working relationship. Who appointed you to your role, uh, Director Barsan? I, I went through an interview process. Okay, so there, but no, was there no an appointment? Point. You interviewed? No. Yep. Okay, so I, I just wanna, I, I know we're in a back and forth about this data and I think we should. I agree with Mayor Fry, we need to be clear on our data, but I, I also don't wanna end up in a ping pong and I wanna respect everybody's time and what they showed up for. Um, and what we're talking about today is that there is a need for public housing funding, That's right. and there is an ask for collaboration across government, yep. um, any levels of government, to put our dollars and our heads together to make it happen. Um, if we can, Mayor Fry, please ask your last question, but then let's move on to the rest of the presentation, and then I will move us into discussion, instead of forcing discussion before the presentation is completed, which we don't usually do. I'll, I'll make my, right, your I'll, last question. Thank you, please. Madam Chair. I'll make my question super short. Are you, do you distinguish, I guess, between uh, ongoing funding uh, and levy funding? They're both deemed to be ongoing, but both can be taken away just like both have been taken away in the past. Do you see a difference between the two, and what is it? I mean, I, I think they're the same. It, it doesn't matter what source the money comes from, um, but we would... As I said from the beginning, and I think Mr. Brand, uh, uh, Member Brand mentioned it, the streets and parks model works, the levy works, the commitment from the city of Minneapolis to its public housing uh, authority works. Yeah. So, so you're looking for a commitment, whether it comes in the form of the levy or comes in the form of funding that you know you're looking for that commitment? Yes. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fry. Please proceed. All right. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so we want to talk more about the power of the Minneapolis Public Housing Levy. Um, so the max 20-year levy um, would deliver an estimated $240 million to the Housing Authority over the next two decades. We've been talking a lot about what that long-term commitment, the benefits of that, for us to be able to more efficiently and effectively plan for projects and le leverage that funding in a variety of ways. If we know that that funding is stable and consistent over time, we are able to plan more proficiently. We're able to plan for those projects that have a longer runway. We are able to better inform what we can exactly do with that money, including what we would do with new housing production. And so without that commitment, we are just really planning from year to year about what we can do. We need that longer term commitment to be able to better inform a development pipeline for the future and better inform how we're going to address our needs of our capital, our capital backlog, but also the needs of our community to add housing units. Um, again, we would leverage this funding um, in a variety of ways, including uh, uh, Director Warsami talked about bonding, um, also debt products, LIHTC, other ways that we could uh, address our portfolio in other ways, knowing that we have this long-term commitment. So with, this 40, with the $45 million ask that we have with the state, along with um, the 20-year the commitment to the levy, we do um, project that we would be able to reduce our capital backlog, uh, our projected capital backlog in 2043 from that $403 million figure down to $130 million, much more manageable figure. Um, again, this does not account for the leveraging opportunities. This doesn't account for the other enhancements that we'd want to do um, to our units. This just really shows an example of how we think this could address our, our capital backlog. Yeah. There's a question. I want to acknowledge that this is not gendered. There was male representation that was doing the thing I asked not to do, and now the female representation on the body has asked to speak, so I don't want it to seem like there's a gender dynamic. I would just like for us to respect our usual process of allowing for presenters to, come finish, to finish their presentations before we start to ask our questions. So if that is okay with the both of you? Yeah. Thank you very much. Director Wasami and team, please proceed. Thank you. Um, we also wanted to mention other, other benefits of the levy. So with a long-term dedicated commitment, we would uh, rely less on other traditional soft sources that are available to both us and other affordable housing developers, like the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We know that is a scarce resource that other affordable housing developers in our community rely on. With this, we would be able to re rely less on that source and other soft sources. Um, again, coupled with tools, RAD conversion, and other HUD tools, our properties would become uh, self-sufficient with reliable federal subsidies annually, um, year after year. Um, again, we could accelerate our new unit development along with uh, accomplishing those other secondary objectives with the funding. Again, increasing and creating new accessible units, doing energy efficiency upgrades, um, creating new housing for homeless and unsheltered, um, invest in resident livability upgrades like we did at the Elliott Twins, uh, where we added exercise rooms and other amenities not usually available in our high rises. Um, and then again, another benefit of this is we have uh, contracting women minority section three contracting goals that we aim to achieve every year. A lot of these dollars would go to those types of contractors that we work with on a regular basis. Um, and we have lots of opportunities. The, the mayor's talked about his convening um, that we've been participating in. We've been talking a lot about the opportunities that we have within our existing portfolio to both preserve, to increase, or to enhance, but also we have a lot of opportunities to add units just within our existing land holdings. We really just need the resources to capitalize on those opportunities. We have done some um, analysis around impacts to taxpayers, um, both to, all to homeowners, commercial properties, and multifamily properties. Um, our analysis that we've done shows that a city median of $316,000 would pay an additional uh, $52 a year 
or $4.41 a month for, for people that own homes of those values in Minneapolis. Commercial properties would see a similar modest increase up to an estimated 3% annually. Um, and affordable housing developments would see increases to $24 to $50 per unit per year or $2 to $4 per unit per month. Um, it's also mentioned that um, this, the levy would put an undue burden on black homeowners. Um, we've looked at that as well. We estimate that there's approximately 27,500 African American households in Minneapolis. Um, the home, owner, home, home ownership rate of uh, African Americans is approximately 19%. Therefore, MPHA estimates that there's uh, around 5,000 to 6,000 African-American homeowners in Minneapolis. But meanwhile, MPHA is serving 26,000 people on a, on a daily basis, of which uh, approximately 83% are African-American, or, or over 20,000 uh, African-American population that we are serving. Um, so again, this would, we do not believe this would do, uh, have an undue burden on black and African American homeowners in Minneapolis. Um, in summary, um, thank you for your time. Um, we believe the agency can generate millions of new funding. Um, the 240 million directly uh, from, the tw from leveraging the, the, the 240 uh, million dollars over the 20 years. Um, we will be able to preserve thousands of units. Um, we would be able to add hundreds of units across our portfolio, especially around Glendale, the scattered sites, and the high rises. Um, and there's also potential to add hundreds of additional new units through unrealized projects enabled by the levy, um, all made possible uh, by the medium homeowner uh, paying $4.41. And the next steps. Um, talk about that, yeah, um, you know, it starts off today. We're presenting to the board. The board um, later in June, we would hope to have a, a city council initiated resolution that would support the full levy funding. Um, doing so would be important to trigger the appropriate notice to Hennepin County, so they can get it ready for the the following year's property tax um, proposed information that they get ready. Um, in August, the mayor will release the city's fiscal year 24 budget um, through the normal budget process, um, and then that just travels. That was the longest normal process. I, I feel kind of strange uh, telling this to this group um, because you are uh, this process. <laughs> um, but anyways, that would be the next steps. And questions? Thank you, colleagues, for holding the rest of your questions. So I'm going to go to Director Bene first, then we'll be at Councilmember Koski, then um, Vice President Brandt, and then myself. Uh, Thank you. Um, so um, one quick comment. If I do get up and leave, I have a park board meeting tonight. And so I, if I miss some, if the meeting's still continuing, I'll watch the rest um, later. Um, but I really appreciate this presentation. I've actually had a lot of questions about um, our public housing stock in the city for a long time as a citizen. Um, but I think a couple of things to say. The one thing I can get my mind around really, really well is the comparison. The number of people have made it to streets and sewers and things. So this is an invested infrastructure that we have in our city portfolio. And I think public housing is incredibly important, I think, to many people in the city of Minneapolis, not just the people that depend on it, but the people that want to support it. Um, but what I would, I would very much, I think, echo what I'm hearing from Mayor Fry, which is I, I re, I'm a civil engineer by day. I need to have an apples to apples comparison. So I don't know what we can do there. This is our one opportunity for, to hear from you. But I'm very compelled by the um, idea that um, it's, it's hard for me to see the city line zeroed out after hearing that back and forth because many places don't even have public housing. And so if we're talking about really just that deferred maintenance backlog, which is a terrible thing to have. It's terrible no matter what that type of asset is because it's, it's taking an investment that was made by taxpayers or people in the past and not, not keeping it up, and regardless of what it is. But the city um, of Minneapolis should get, I think, a lot of credit for housing, uh, uh, having a, lot, a large public uh, portfolio of housing that most other places in the state might not even have. And that's a commitment the city has made to say we want people that rely on public housing to live in our city. This, this, these properties won't be on the tax roll. They're going to be doing something else. So 
I really would like to see that apples to apples comparison about really what we're talking about, particularly around that deferred maintenance backlog. That would be very compelling to me. And what other cities are doing that are on your on your sheet. Thank you. Okay, good. Councilmember Koski. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so I, I just want to make sure I think I hear you. Um, what you are looking for is consistency in funding so that you can plan. Yes. Okay. So the levy, you know, if approved, um, is approved year to year still. Yes. And so this too is still not guaranteed money. We are still approving this year to year. Um, and so I think we're making assumptions you know, in your presentation, which I appreciate because I love these big plans. I love hearing all the amazing work. And I, you know, I saw assumptions of a, a 20 year plan, but we're making the assumption that year to year for 20 years that BET council to council is going to continue to support this to the, to the max. And so I still feel that even though we're trying, if the goal is trying to get consistency so you can plan, I still feel that we still have a year to year. Um, and so I, I kind of go back to my question of this tool versus the way that we are continuing to fund you um, is neither is, is necessarily guaranteed. Um, and so I just want to, you know, point that out and also understand like if we were to move forward with this type of levy you know how would you handle that year to year still um, approval process that we would need to go through yeah I mean we um, uh, uh, council member Koski um, you know we can only go for the low hanging fruits we have a tool we have a state statute it's year to year we have to go for that because otherwise it will be irresponsible of us because there's a tool there, we're suffering, our residents are suffering, and we go for that tool. But we've asked for, and our ideal world is to do exactly what was done to the parks and streets, to look at MPHA's needs, have a 20-year uh, ordinance that guarantees 20-year funding, a certain amount that we can plan for for the future. That's the ideal, but we need to have to start from somewhere. And those, the low-hanging fruit today is the year-to-year -year funding, which we don't get. And I know, let's talk about how much the city has funded us. We don't get outside of a million dollars from the city of Minneapolis to year-to-year. -year. And that's only started with Mayor Fry a couple of years ago. It's $1 million. The levy at least says it's $12 million you can get. We have to go for that. So it's not an ideal situation, but it's what we have. And that's what we're presenting to you and to other council members. But I know within your you know, how intelligent you folks are and the authority you have, you can maybe get us to the ideal or closer to it. Yeah, I just wanna, yes, reiterate that I think it was 1.2 million is the most that we've ever done through this levy in the past. And so- um, that, That's the property values 14 years ago, plus it was only 20%, plus it was only for security guards. Now we're paying 1.2 million a year through the levy. Now we're paying like 4 million a year, just from our own pockets towards security guards. And that's at the expense of fixing somebody's boiler. So there's a lot of challenges. The same challenges you face with all the variables with the city, we're facing a lot of challenges. And the problem is we're dealing with very, very vulnerable people. And then the challenges are compounding now because you have issues with mental illness. You have folks now coming off the homeless uh, waiting list from the county that are compounding some of the challenges we're seeing in our high rises and in our uh, scatter sites. Yep. Thank you. Vice President Brent. Director Wasami, my interest was piqued by your reference to the forgotten corner of the Holman site, um, which is still bare land uh, 28 years after the consent decree was signed. Uh, it's my recollection that that was uh, planned to be essentially low density um, housing, uh, single family housing. And my question is, do you um, are you still bound by the terms of the consent decree or has that lapsed? And is that type of housing the best uh, way to fill the city's housing needs? Laura, you know? I don't think we would want to weigh in on a legal matter um, at this meeting. Um, but we 
know that the community's needs have changed. Um, and I think we would attempt to relook at what would be best suited for that community and meet that community's needs today and into the future. Thank you. All right, I'll close this out. Um, I have a direct question for you to start with. There's like, let's just name the elephant in the room. People are saying it might not be used this way and they're, they're absolutely right, they're not wrong. So I'm just gonna ask you directly, how do you plan on using the funding should you get it? Are you going to use it for public housing residents? Would you go on the record to say so? Oh, 100%. Public housing residents will go, every dime will go to our residents. So I just wanted and to I ask even, that direct question. I can even add, we, we wouldn't take anything for operations. So it would be preservation production of our mm -hmm. units. Great. Um, the other thing of just, I like to do a repeat back. So one thing I'm hearing from you is you're wanting to diversify your funding sources. So you're not, you're not limiting yourself just to a levy. You're not suggesting that that's a solution, the silver bullet. You're saying you're trying to diversify your funding sources and add to. You're not saying take away. You're, you're advocating for any and all possibilities because of your backlog and then just the needs of the residents. Yeah, we, we, are, we are going for whatever resources that's out there. We have a state ask, 45 million at the state. We're working with the county to figure out way, way, ways they can assist us. Mm -hmm. The mayor has put a convening committee. We're part of that. We did the same type of presentation there, mm -hmm. uh, the, the levy details. So we're here just being transparent. We're just trying to give you all the information that we have, and let's figure out a way forward. But the, the status quo does not work, because if one of these systems, God forbid, one of these systems fail, you will have hundreds of people who will be put on tents, mm -hmm. and we already have enough tents in Minneapolis. Yes, I mean, we have a systemic issue of, of many systemic issues that we're addressing. And so I, again, my comments are not to say that the city is not doing enough. I'm part of the city, so I'd be talking about myself. Um, it, it's not about giving credit to, to anyone or anything. It's simply the fact of the matter is that it is still not enough. Fabulous that we're doing it and we still have to go harder and it is still not enough for stability, for consistency, to have generational impact, for sustainability, and for life and safety. Yes. Um, people have lost their lives because they're living in buildings that are not up to snuff by any means. Fires and just other things not equipped. I was there on the day that I testified along with Mayor Fry, Representative Wansley, um, and S, uh, Representative Abaje, um, where we were all testifying in support of public housing and more specifically around fire suppression systems. Um, and so there's also a, a life and safety issue that exists there. And even on a national level, um, you mentioned mental health. Um, Jordan Neely, who is an unhoused man who was having a mental health crisis on a train saying that he is suffering while he's waiting to get on this housing list. And so I think when we talk about the numbers, yes, we have to talk about the numbers and the financial impact, but there's real stories behind those numbers. And, and we talk about experts and we, we trust our experts, you, your staff, um, residents of our city. Tenants are the experts of their living conditions. Yep. They know the conditions of, I'm gonna get, sometimes yep, I, I'm preaching, yeah. so give oh. me just a minute. Yeah, they, I have a thought um, that I don't wanna lose. So. <laughs> they know that they are the experts of their living conditions. That's true. We're blessed to not live with black mold in our house. Amen. We're blessed to not deal with lead. And when we talk about safety, we should talk about the impacts of lead, which are two things, development of our children's brains and that generational, if a pregnant woman gets lead poisoning, it's at least four generations that those children will continue to carry the effects yeah. of the lead poisoning. That is factual. Mm -hmm. And it also can lead to violent tendencies. So when we're talking about life and safety, this has an impact of the conditions that we're leaving people to live in. And while we made those investments, and we should champion, we should be proud that we're making those investments and that we're taking a principled stance on our values as a city. But when people are still sitting here telling us, it's not reaching them. These, the, the money that is being given, so that either means that you're not putting it where it goes, but you're telling us where it goes and I'm seeing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I went and we've met many times. Or it means that it's still not deep enough to impact the people that are here and many, many others that couldn't be here today that are telling you filthy water is leaking through the shower down below her and she's, she's being bathed by filthy water. Mm -hmm. Or people that are living with black mold or accessibility issues. Accessibility issues are, are not optional. They are mandatory. They are basic, minimum, again, life-sustaining things that people need. Um, and so, um, you know, they're also the experts of how to make a dollar out of 15 cents and trying to make the dream work out of that. Um, and so we, we need to also listen to them as the experts and understand that when people show up to testify, 
Um, you know, we can debate back and forth about, you know, politicizing things. Um, but for me, this isn't about politicizing. This is simply saying that when people are showing up in mass and writing in on mass and they're writing op-eds and they're organizing their communities, if they were good, they wouldn't show up. They're showing up because they're not good. They're still deeply harmed. They're still deep impacts. They're not getting what they need. And the investments that they're making, we're, we're starting to see some change, but it is still not enough. Mm -hmm. So it is going to require for all of us to work together, not focus on where we don't agree. I think we're always clear about that as elected leaders, um, but focus on where we do agree and where we can find solutions to work together um, and find a way um, to, as a government, make a dollar out of 15 cents, like the residents of our city have to do every single day and struggle like my father has to do mm -hmm. and like I've had to do myself. Um, and so I just, I really want to focus on that. And when we talk about undue tax burden, um, let's be equitable about it. We've got the Emerald Ash board trees. We've got the access road for Upper Harbor Terminal, terminal and the assessment. We have the increase to the fourth and fifth ward, which is why I voted no on increasing the, the taxes because it was going to be an undue burden on fourth and fifth ward residents on the north side, but we do it anyway. So all I'm saying is, is that there, there, is always, there are always risks and there are always impacts um, at various levels. And um, I think that we can consider and put our heads together and figure out how an impact of a levy could work, um, why it's important, why it's critical, and start doing some deeper engagement with residents to hear more, show up, hear more stories, um, and start to work together in a way that's collaborative and so that people feel heard and also are at the table for solutions, whether they're a financial expert or they're just a resident, uh, they're an expert as being a resident in their housing that's just missing the mark. Um, and those are my comments. Right. If, if I can add one thing, and I, and I, I heard a couple of things that I want to clarify. One, I live in Minneapolis. I love Minneapolis. It's a great city, and our public housing infrastructure is, is a great asset for Minneapolis. And I agree with uh, the member. Her name wasn't on there, so, yeah, Abene. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with what, what she, or what the, the member commented that Minneapolis is a great city. The past administrations built this infrastructure with the federal government, but we need to preserve this infrastructure. You know, we can't replicate it. We can tweak it. We need to preserve it. And while, what we come here is to present a tool. So you see, at the end of the day, it's going to be the elected officials that make the decision. But this is a tool that can work to make sure that Minneapolis gets better, that the most vulnerable population in Minneapolis are housed. It's not going to be a panacea. It's not going to solve the affordable housing crisis. It's not going to solve homelessness. I'm not here to sell you something that cannot happen. But we have 210 million backlog. We're an affluent city. We have the resources. Let's prioritize our poorest community. And that's what we're presenting. Second of all, in terms of deployment, in terms of deployment, we can deploy these resources. We have the capacity. We do it all the time. We, you know, we, we, we know how to maintain, we know how to build. We lack resources. And every year we're challenged. Do we do the boiler? Do we do the windows? Do we do the elevator? Do we deal with the mold? You know, do we have enough staff? We are challenged. And I think the city of Minneapolis, working with us, we can change a lot of things. And again, you should be proud of MPHA. We are lauded across the country. We've done things nobody's done across the country. We're one of the largest housing authorities across the country. So we have the capacity, we have the know-how, but you have the ability, but focus on it. Let's not politicize it. Apples to apples, comparison to comparisons. There's nothing that compares to MPHA across the state of Minnesota, nothing. There's nothing of our size. We're the ninth largest housing authority in the country. There's 3,000 of them. We're the ninth largest. So I think, yes. Uh, sure. Mayor Frick and Vice President Brent, did you have a last comment? Okay, uh, Mayor Frick, would you close this out? Uh, the last thing that the director said, I think, is is exactly right. I mean, mm -hmm. there there is no dispute uh, about the gap in funding, about the the deferred maintenance, about the work that needs to take place around both production and preservation. Uh, we're all there, and uh, the the question here that is before all of us is how do we partner uh, to get it done? Well said. All right, well, that concludes our business today. Uh, clerk, please receive and file this presentation. Again, we want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, this is the beginning of many conversations and adjourned. Thank you.